A common flow of network traffic is from a client to send information to the server and the server to reply with additional details. Some of this information that's being sent back and forth between the client and the server may contain information that an attacker would love to be able to see and to be able to collect. Once that information is collected, the attacker may be able to reuse that information with a replay attack. To be able to perform a replay attack, the attacker has to be able to have information that can be replayed. This can be difficult for the attacker to obtain. Some of the techniques they might use would be to use a physical network tap to watch the traffic, perhaps use ARP poisoning to redirect traffic to the attacker, or the attacker may put malware on the victim's computer to be able to gather information going across the network. Once the attacker has these details, they can replay this back to the server, effectively posing as the victim computer. The replay itself is not an on-path attack, although it is very common to perform an on-path attack to gather the details that later will be used for a replay attack. One form of a replay attack is called pass the hash. The hash in this context refers to a password hash that is normally used during the authentication process. This starts with the client or the victim computer sending a normal authentication request to a server. During that process, the attacker has put in place a way to redirect or get a copy of that traffic also sent to the attacker's computer. So effectively, they're capturing a username and a hashed password which is identical to the username and hash password being sent to the server. Once the attacker has this information, they can replay the username and hashed password back to the server posing as the original client. The server receives a username and hashed password that properly authenticates, so the attacker now has access to the server posing as the victim computer. One way to stop this replay attack from occurring is to use encryption so that none of the traffic sent across the network can be seen. And this also might include some additional salting of the password so that each time an authentication occurs, it's using a different salt and therefore a different hash. The server is configured to not accept the same hash twice in a row. So if the attacker does somehow gain access to this salted hash, they wouldn't be able to use a replay attack to gain access to the server. Another valuable piece of information that an attacker would love to retrieve from your computer are your browser cookies. These cookies are simply files that store information about the sites that you visit. This is a way for your browser to maintain tracking and session management when you're connecting to websites. The cookie is not an executable and it doesn't contain any malicious code, but it does contain information that would be valuable for an attacker to gain access to a server. This could also be a privacy risk. If you look through the information that's contained in the cookies stored in your browser, there's username information, other details about the connection, and things that a third party could use to learn more about you. The information that an attacker would love to pull out of these cookies, though, would be a session ID. This session ID could be used by an attacker to gain access to a server without needing any login credentials from the victim. The session hijacking or sidejacking occurs when a user authenticates initially with a web server. So they provide a username and password, and a session ID is sent back to the victim's computer. If the attacker does gain access to the session ID, they can use it for subsequent sessions to the web server. And every time they use this session ID, the web server thinks it's coming from the original victim's computer, which is now logged in. And the attacker would now have access to everything the victim machine would have on that web server. The session ID and many other details are contained within the headers that are sent back and forth between systems. These headers could be gathered using some type of packet capture, such as Wireshark or Kismet. There are also exploits like cross-site scripting that can gather these details on a client machine and have those details sent to the attacker. The attacker might also modify the headers that they're sending to a victim server. And through the years, we've used tools like Tamper, Firesheep, and Scapey to be able to accomplish this. There are also a number of add-ons and extensions you can put in your browser to be able to view your cookies and modify the information that's contained within those cookies. One way to prevent this session hijacking is to simply encrypt everything. If you're encrypting from the source device and all of that data is encrypted all the way until you reach the destination device, anyone monitoring this traffic would not be able to see any of your session IDs or any other personal information. 
This requires the server to be configured to allow encryption using HTTPS. And these days, many servers are already configured to allow this type of encryption. There are also extensions that you can enable in your browser that will require that the connection between you and a web server is running HTTPS, and it will prevent any type of access that may be in the clear. If you can't encrypt end to end, you might want to encrypt from your device to a VPN concentrator. That would at least allow for encryption on the first part of the journey. And the only part that would be in the clear is the part that is after the VPN concentrator.